Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the Industrial Control System Information Sharing and Analysis Center's monthly briefing. We'll take another minute or two to give those who are still a chance to complete the process. During this time, I'll provide some housekeeping notes. If you're calling in on the telephone, you'll find a PIN number on the GoToWebinar application. Enter this PIN into your phone and press pound. This will allow us to manage back. My name is Debbie Wendell and I will be moderating today's session. I serve as Community Director for the Center and oversee the Center's human-to-human -human information dissemination mechanisms. In case you're not yet aware of the products that we have to offer, make sure you check out our LinkedIn group, Twitter account, and website blog posts. Plus, we hope that you will take full advantage of these member briefings and our Thursday open forum discussion sessions. Our goal here at Timely and Actionable Information in a way that suits their needs. Today's briefing, ICS Security in Rail Transit features Dave Tumum, CEO of Tumum Technical, as this month's subject matter expert, and will be hosted by ICS ISAC Chair Chris Blask. During today's presentation, polls, and I'm going to start your first one now. I understand there's a little bit of lag time on my side between talking and the stuff coming up, so for that. Chris will take the first few minutes of our call to give a brief center overview and bring you up to speed on the latest developments from the center. Next, Dave will spend about 30 minutes for his presence. There will be a Q&A session at the end and open discussion for you to participate. And now some more housekeeping guidelines and our second poll. I will be attempting to keep as many of you as possible off of mute so that you can speak your thoughts or raise questions as appropriate. But please mute your questions if necessary to help reduce unwanted background noise. When speaking, please introduce yourself and indicate your industry affiliation. Additionally, if you'd like to ask a question, you may also use the hand raise feature in the GoToWebinar application. After the meeting session will be available on the center's website. Slides may be available upon request and at the presenter's discretion. Please contact an ICS ISACs for their information. All right. So it looks like many of you have attended the intro call. Very good. So now, without any further delay, it's to you for your center update. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, attending. And uh, we've had this slide up there probably for a moment or two with our mission and how the ISAC fits with other ISACs. And seeing that most of you have seen our intro before, we won't dig into that whole lot too much. But a couple statements about who we are and how we look at things. Um, our perspective on these issues is that there really is just one infrastructure. And that uh, while we look at it sector by sector uh, for very good reasons, at the end of the day, it's, it's an inter interdependent web. And this uh, um, 2001 study by Carnegie Mellon, it does a good job of looking at it. And from, from this visualization as a facility, what are the dependencies, what are the failure modes? Um, as interdependent infrastructures, how do we connect to each other, um, and, and how are the failure modes of one infrastructure like power or, as we're talking about today, transportation, rail, and so forth, linked to failures in, in others, and how we all end up um, living inside a, a, a spaghetti diagram. For those of you who work in the power uh, space, you're familiar with, with that term. But everything's connected to everything else. Um, one of the issues, particularly as we go through this whole executive order NIST framework uh, process uh, that is, is uh, particularly of the point, is the taxonomy of information sharing. And it's, for those of us who spend a lot of time on this, these issues, it's uh, 
a bit redundant to say this, but there are issues in sharing information. Currently, CISPA uh, is, is up for uh, uh, discussion again, and civil liberties and other organizations are, are uh, putting their concerns forth that uh, the privacy information uh, it, you know, the, the privacy of information is not protected as well enough. So when we talk about information sharing, it's important to understand the differences of different types of information. So for the, our purposes, when we look at this, we talk about it in these three ways. And we use the words data to mean atomic pieces of information. This could be the configuration of a device that's deployed in the field. This could be a syslog message. This could be uh, an IDS alert. That's data. Information is when you pull all this together. So if you're running a rail system or running a power system or a water system or manufacturing, whatever it is, all of the data about your network, all of the configuration information that sums up to give you the topology and the actual deployed inventory and infrastructure, all of the traffic information, the event information that tells you what it's doing, that is the information that you need to actually operate your systems. When we talk about information sharing or knowledge sharing, we're generally not talking about that information. We're talking about the knowledge of that information. And we'll touch on that as we go through this. And for those who, 50, 60 percent of you who've heard this before, um, you know, we'll, we'll, you've heard this, but we'll talk about the difference there as well, specifically what that means. But the knowledge of that information is what the rest of us can use. It's not necessarily that you have configured a device or you have configured your network thus and such. You don't necessarily need to tell anybody that perhaps through error or other omission you haven't uh, met a compliance uh, that, that perhaps you should have. You don't have to risk uh, having a, a, a regulatory fine or other impact or legal impact. Uh, we don't really need to go there at all to achieve the national end, the international end, the global uh, or community regional end that we have of keeping that one infrastructure up and running. But we do know, we do need to know, we need to have the knowledge that the nation is under attack or it isn't, that 13% of water facilities were or were not attacked last Wednesday. So again, it's the information we don't necessarily need. We don't necessarily need to know that it was you, that it was your facility, but we need to know that facilities are or are not being attacked. So we look at how we, how we can enable structures on the human level, as Debbie uh, is responsible for, how we can talk to each other and have these sorts of conversations at the automation level, at the machine to machine level, how we can share that knowledge and how we can have facilities who have that knowledge in the first place. Because when you look at knowledge, um, it is, as uh, dictionary.com will tell us, the fact or condition of being aware of something. So situational awareness is, for example, the ultimate goal of the, ex the presidential executive order we're all dealing with. The deliverable number four, which is the, the end result of all that, is situational awareness. And as a nation and as a world and as states, industries, however definition of, of you, uh, you know, we, we talk about situational awareness. Knowledge is, is everything. You do you know who you are? If you are a facility, an asset owner, for example, do you know what devices you have? Do you have your, your inventory? Do you know what you're capable of? Do you know what mandates you have? Do you know what restrictions you have? You know, do you know how you assess risk? We have to know these things. As a state, you know, do we know what facilities we have um, and what shape they're in and what legal mandates we have? That level of visibility. You know, do you know what you have? You know, do you have an inventory of devices if you are a facility? If you are a nation, if you are a, a region, do you know uh, the infrastructure that you have and how it interconnects with each other? And do you know what it's doing? So again, at a facility level, you know, this means literally, can you see the traffic on your industrial control system network? Do you know how your devices talk to each other? Do you know what they do on a moment by moment basis? Would you be able to tell if it suddenly changed and that was a bad thing? Do you have those capabilities of knowing what you have, who you are, and what, and what your stuff is doing? So we look at those sort of things. So that ultimately we can build knowledge networks. So that facilities, owner operators, the service providers who work with them, the integrators and the, the operators and outsourcers can create individual facilities that have knowledge, that know who they are, know what they have, know what it's doing. That they can take appropriate parts of that knowledge and share it with the public or the private 
sector in ways that the rest of us beyond the, the gates, um, the, the guards, guns, and gates of individual facilities can keep our cultures, our communities, and our municipalities working. And ultimately, um, in, the, in the real world, build self-defending infrastructures, self-defending communities. As President Obama said in the State of the Union, you know, the self-healing power grid, for example. You know, as Dave is here to talk about with transportation and rail, again, we need to have rail systems, national rail systems, that will detect that they just came under attack just now and defend themselves at speeds that are faster than we can have human sharing. And this is our point as we look at the executive order, as we're involved with the NIST framework, request for information, that conversation, the points that we're making are that we can create this reference architecture this year and demonstrate this as is mandated in the executive order, in Presidential Policy Directive 21, as NIST is mandated to deliver with the framework in 240 days from February 12th, where we can take the components, the entities like all of us here, the entities uh, in the public sector, the state, local, municipal, federal sector, and uh, the, the transport, the standards like sticks and taxi, um, for those of you who are technical enough to follow those sort of things, like the experience, the research education network, the REN ISAC has done in creating real-time uh, um, sharing and reactive networks already, and make an architecture this year where we can see this, where some source of knowledge could be a rail system who just came under attack you know, in, in, during my last sentence, can share that information with some center, like the ICS ISAC, who can share that with other centers, who can share that with asset owners. So the asset owners can take immediate automated defenses. Or at the very least, for example, that distribution or that transmission, electric utility in the lower left, um, maybe they choose to put in monitoring rules for certain types of knowledge that's shared with them. So they can automatically s set up rules that effectively will tell the operators there is something live going on out there right now. If you see this from this moment forward, let an operator know. But a human operator knows it so that they can take action. That that facility can then look at its own forensics and ask itself the question of its data and its information. Have I ever seen this before? If so, it can give that information to the operators, to the, to the, to the utility itself. And they can do whatever they need to do to, to run their facility. But they can take the knowledge of that, uh, that information that, yes, I saw this six months ago. Six weeks ago, I started to see a lot. Six days ago, it started to spike. They can take that knowledge and share it back with nodes in greater knowledge networks who can then share it with more nodes. And through these mechanisms, through the creation of this reference architecture that we're currently engaged with, uh, multiple folks, some of whom I, I can see on the phone right now, in establishing our lab and exercising this at that point in working with, uh, with NIST and with THS and with the administration and with uh, the state governors, the Southern States Energy Board, vendors and integrators to, to create this reference architecture. So our response to the, the NIST framework uh, is out there. There's a copy on our uh, public blog on the, on the center site. It's also at that URL on the uh, on the uh, NIST uh, site. There's a meeting in, uh, there was a meeting April 3rd in Washington that uh, we went to and had a fair bit to say. Uh, there's another meeting at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh on May 29th. will be the next workshop in this series. So for all of you with an interest in this, uh, it would encourage you to be involved in what way is appropriate for you. So with all of that, I'll let Debbie uh, throw to Dave and uh, we can march forward with this whole thing. Debbie? Fantastic. Thanks, Chris, for that update. Now for this month's ICS ICER. Dave Timmerman, CISSP, is an independent consultant and president of Timmerman Technical LLC in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Dave has been involved in ICS security since 2002 and specializes in control system security projects. He is facilitator for and past chair of 
the American Public Transportation Associations, or APTAS, Control and Communication Group, and he's the author of the book, Industrial Network Security, now in its second edition. All right, I have your third poll up there. I'll kind of get an idea of what industry y'all are from. Let me take a second and fill that up. All right, closing poll. All right, Dave, the floor is now yours. Please go ahead with your presentation. Well, thank you, Debbie, and good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be speaking about cybersecurity in rail control and communications. Uh, next slide, please. I'm a facilitator for a working group of the American Public Transportation Association. That's a nonprofit international association of 1,500 public and private sector organizations, uh, transit agencies for buses, light rail, commuter rail, subways, high-speed rail. More than 90% of the people using public transportation in the U.S and Canada would ride on an APTA member system. Next slide, please. APTA, and on the next slide you will see the web link, is very active in standards programs. We have standards programs for rails, buses, for maintenance, reliability, safety, and most important for us, security and cybersecurity. If you go to www.apta.com, as you see on the top of this slide, um, you can peruse through the rail standards and you can take a look at the standards that our working group has issued already, which I'll be talking about in another minute. Next slide, please. I'd like to get into, well, what are some threats to rail transit? Uh, what's happened in the past in the way of incidents that we could look at? Next slide, please. On the next slide, you'll see some typical elements of a rail transit system. Over on the left, you have the operations control room. That's actually the control room of SEPTA, which is the transit agency for Philadelphia. You have train stations. You have traction power substations to distribute electricity. Uh, miles and miles of track. And of course, rail vehicles. And then if you take a look at the bottom right, the wayside signal bungalow, that contains the safety critical or the vital uh, signaling instrumentation that we'll be talking about a little later when we talk about the standards that we're developing. Uh, next slide, please. So the question is, well, what incidents have happened in the past? Starting off kind of from the least significant incident, this happened in May 2006. Hackers libel Canadian Prime Minister on train signs. So an ident unidentified, now <laughs> we, we don't use this word too much here, but in Canada and England it's pop popular, ne'er-do-well broke into systems controlling electronic signs on Toronto's westbound GO Transit train to substitute transport updates for banners marking the Canadian political leader. Now, what they did actually is, you know those scrolling signs inside the uh, train vehicles? Well, picture somebody coming home from work after a hard day and kind of dozing off, and then he sees the scrolling sign saying, 
Stephen Harper eats babies. <laughs> that's actually what did happen, and that's what they're talking about. So that's kind of the bottom of the ladder on incidents. Somebody hacking in, they made the papers, it's a lot of mischief. But if we go to the next slide, then we'll see uh, something a little bit more serious and kind of ominous as far as what attacks could await us. Um, this is an event which happened in 2008 in the city of, well, it's spelled L-O-D-Z, so you'd think it's pronounced Ludz, but it's, it's actually pronounced Łódź in Polish. And here in the middle, you see a 14-year-old kid being taken into custody. On the right, you see his hacking apparatus. It was surprisingly a TV remote where he reprogrammed the channel changers with the codes that would switch the track switches for the city's tram system. And you can see what happened in the left. What happened is these two trams were supposed to pass each other at maybe 15, 20 miles an hour and go along their merry way. Instead, he switched the switch at the last minute and had one collide with the other. And uh, people went flying, and about 15 people went to the hospital. So this is a 14-year-old kid doing his kind of extracurricular science project and ending up arrested. But this goes to show you that if, let's say, it was replaced the 14-year-old kid with 15 uh, PhDs from Iran or North Korea or something attacking US infrastructure, you know, the potential is there. So that's a little summary of what some of the past incidents that have happened. And next slide, please. So to address this danger, uh, APTA started up cybersecurity working groups. And I'm the facilitator of one of them. Next slide, please. On the next slide, you'll see we have two uh, volunteer working groups. Now on the top, that's the Enterprise Cybersecurity Working Group. And that's really IT systems. Uh, you see a kiosk there from SEPTA. They've been working since 2011 on the IT side, whereas we've been active on the control and communication security side since 2007. That's a a drawing there of a power grid for uh, the railroad here. And next slide, we'll take a look at some of the members we have in our working group. We've got some big transit agencies. Uh, you see Toronto Transit, LA Metro, Scepter from Philadelphia, Houston Metro, New Jersey Transit. And going across the slide, we have vendors, uh, Harris Corp, Phoenix Contact. But you'll notice that some of the big control system vendors like GE and Siemens, for instance, also make control systems for rail. So we have in common like PLCs, the safety PLCs, with other sectors using control systems. Uh, going back to the left-hand side for government, we have FRA supporting us. Uh, we have very good support from Department of Homeland Security, CSSP, which is now ICS CERT, and Transportation Security Administration. So we're very grateful for that help and support. And then we have consultants like myself. And um, Lee Weber, uh, now he is with Exida, um, has been the editor. And I will get into some of the things we'll be doing together uh, in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So next slide, we see some of the documents we have been working on. We have published part one. It was issued July 2010. And that's really getting started, establishing a control and communication security program and doing a risk assessment. We're currently working on recommended practice part two. That's in balloting. should be released July 2013. And 
We are working now on recommended practice part three, and that's going to cover attack modeling, which is very interesting and leading edge as a new security analysis tool. So next slide, please. Let's take a look at where we were when we started in 2007. We were kind of at the bottom of the learning curve. Um, in 2007, uh, unlike some other sectors like electricity and um, oil, gas, chemicals that started earlier, 2007, we were Cyber 101. We were here, the green star there. Then kind of looking up Cyber 202, 303, 404, well, the published documents out there are very good if you understand this material, if you know all the terms and you're introduced to control system security. There are documents like the NIST 800, very valuable, DHS publications, ISA, S99, and actually I was a uh, work group leader for one of the early work groups in that effort, and then uh, NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission 5.71, which actually references 800. So there was a lot of good stuff there, but unfortunately wasn't written for the control engineer for a transit agency, uh, kind of overworked, uh, wearing five different hats, and with no introduction to cybersecurity. So next slide, please. Uh, part one, it was just the first step up the learning curve. We described the typical rail control and communication systems. We told the transit agencies, well, how do you or get organized, uh, obtain management support, form a security team? Uh, if I could have the next slide, that would be good. And how to do a risk assessment and do risk management. So that was basically uh, our part one. Um, are we advancing slides? Okay, we've skipped a slide, that's okay. Um, we're now on part two. And part two, we said, okay, with part one, we're up to Cyber 202. The Green Star has made it up one step. We're part two, which is going to be issued uh, July, and part two has some teeth in it. Uh, part two has some requirements, and even though it's a recommended practice, we know that transit agencies are going to attach that recommended practice to their request for proposals. So the vendor community to rail transit will need to start supplying that in response if they do want to do the bids. And what we did as a core group is we said, okay, now let's tap into the NIST 800. Now let's tap into the DHS, the ISA. So we absorb the still condense translate control security uh, from those documents at Cyber 404 into railroad ease. And uh, next slide, we'll show you what we cover in part two. We introduced security zone architecture. That's from Defense in Depth, published by DHS. Uh, the latest publication was 2009. We adopted DHS security zones from defense and layer to transit and defined those security zones for transit systems. We outline the highest consequence zones, the let's say the high risk, high consequence zones, signaling, fire life safety, and we partitioned the zones from each other's. And then we went back to NIST 800, and we use 853 for a list of security controls that we brought down to the industry. And I'll tell you the selection criteria in a minute. Uh, can I have the next slide, um, we'll take a look at typical railway system and what are the components that we're concerned about. Um, you see a uh, typical railway track, and on the right-hand side, there's signal lights. Those are like red, yellow, and green, like traffic lights. On the left-hand side, you see those overhead wires. Those bring traction power to the train cars. 
And then you see a little um, rectangular sign there. It's dark, but usually that would be a scrolling message saying train arrives in five minutes or something. So that's passenger information. And if we can go to the next slide, we could see how we rank those as far as consequence zones. If somebody hacked in, what would be the effect on the railroad? And clearly, I don't think anybody could dispute that if somebody gets into the signaling and interlocking and switches the switch the wrong way, like the Polish kid did, or puts a green for a train so it goes full speed ahead when it's supposed to stop at a red, uh, that's high consequences. It can cause collision, loss of life, damage, and also fire, life, safety, emergency. So those are the highest consequence zones. In the middle, skate attraction power. If you have no electricity because the SCADA system's been cut off, then you can't go anyplace. And at the bottom is the passenger information display, which is inconvenience. It's like that Toronto Go Transit event. Next slide, please. When we were looking at the Department of Homeland Security paper on manufacturing de defense in depth, um, some of you may have seen this if you read the paper. It's typical uh, manufacturing at the bottom. You have the safety st stuff, and that's the most protected zone. Then you have the next one, the control zone, and then further on you have a DMZ going to the enterprise zone. So he says, okay, well, this is for a manufacturing plant or a chemical plant, but what happens when the infrastructure is spread out all over the town like in a rail transit system. So if I could have the next slide. The next slide shows how we transformed uh, the DHS model into railroad ease. We see on the left hand uh, operations control center. Then we see a train station in the middle. And then we see a diagram for that signal bungalow that I pointed out on the slide before. And they're different colors. The yellow is what we call SCSZ, Safety Critical Signaling Zone. And this is, it's vital. For a chemical plant, it would be equivalent to an SIS, Safety Instrumented System. Um, so there's yellow in the signal bungalow and the train station. There'll be a signal room. Blue is fire safety emergency. That's in the train station, the operations control center. And black will be the traction power. Uh, operationally critical, which, you know, if you cut power, nobody goes anywhere, but there's not lives in jeopardy immediately. So that's what we did. We kind of spread these zones out geographically, and then we figured out how to segment them and how they talk to each other. Next slide, please. So what we did is, on the next slide, you see we took all the different systems in a typical transit system. And we segmented those and categorized them uh, yellow, blue, green, and tan. Uh, the yellow, um, lower left, those as the vital signaling and the computer-based train control if you have. So that's safety critical. The blue is the fire life safety, all the emergency stuff. The green is the operationally critical, and the tan is the enterprise, which the other working group from APTA will be doing. Next slide, please. So we've shown how we transform the DHS defense and depth model to show how we categorized and drew circles around the different zones as it's spread out geographically. So let's take a look. This slide here is some of the 22 security controls that we brought down from NIST 853. Um, if you take a look, and it's a little bit of fine print, um, we draw electronic security perimeters. We borrowed that term from NERC-SIP around SCSZ and FLSZ to separate them from other zones. And then this is 
uh, words right from NERC SIP, all network routable interfaces connecting these with other lesser severity zones should use an isolation device, uh, aka a hard, hardware firewall or equivalent. Uh, we require configuration management, man, manual or software. Uh, we talk about access control. And generally, the way uh, the core group of us screened the NIST 853 controls, we wanted controls which were understandable to the control engineers from transit walking up the learning term. We wanted controls that gave you bang for the buck. We wanted controls that the industry could kind of slip in, bolt on now, and then as we walk up the learning curve, uh, they could build in. So for instance, the last control used host file integrity verification. We're asking for a cryptographic checksum. That would be like a SHA-1 or SHA-2 if you're familiar with cryptography built into the vital PLCs to identify the files or what they should be. And that's something that they would have to go back to the drawing board and maybe put in a product three, four years down the road. So we put that as a to be developed. So we wanted things in these controls that had big banks for the buck, were easily understandable, and were doable with today's technology on a bolt-on or a slip-in and pave the way for the future. So if we, those are some of the controls we have. We have 22 of them. Uh, next slide, please. We're now working on part three. And part three, we're doing something very interesting, attack modeling. Sometimes that's known as threat modeling. We call it attack modeling. And we're doing the operationally critical zone. This is the work we're doing right now. Uh, next slide, please. Attack modeling, we got request from TSA, uh, Transportation Security Administration, when they reviewed our part two, um, which they liked, they said, well, could you do something like threat modeling? That's uh, state of the art, it would be nice if you could include that in. So our answer to that challenge was attack modeling. And that uses attack trees. You may have seen these before in the literature as popularized for cybersecurity by Bruce Schneier. It's a modification for a fault tree that's used in um, the chemical industry for safety. And we do our attack modeling with some sophisticated software. Uh, the name of the software is called Security by Amanaza. And there's a fellow, Terry Inglesby, who's the CEO of an Amanaza, who was good enough to let the work group use his software for the models and everything. And we're working with him. And he's a key resource for this. So we're excited about this. It's state of the art. Um, I'll give you just a little introduction in the next few slides. If we go to the next slide, please. The next slide, we'll see a typical light rail signal bungalow. You've seen that on the lower right-hand side. And this has the, they call it a vital PLC. It's a safety PLC made by your big systems integrators and control uh, system vendors. And it sits inside that locked bunker. And if we go to the next slide, we could take a look at a little network diagram, which is actually color coded with yellow and green for the consequence areas that we're in. Uh, inside the, the bungalow is the yellow. We see a firewall. We've added in a vital microprocessor. Uh, it goes up, and the I.O. goes to track circuit signal switches. These are all vital or safety critical. And it connects to the green, which is the uh, non-vital operational critical coming from the operational control. So a dispatch signal says to the bungalow um, circuitry, um, switch the switch and light the signal light. A train's coming through. 
and only if the interlocking is satisfied, there, there's no contradicting uh, conditions, will the vital PLC send that signal through to the switches and the uh, signals. So that's how that works. Uh, if we take a look at the next slide, uh, we've modeled this with attack tree concepts. And this is just a very um, light introduction to what an attack tree. It uses AND gates. That's the top blue gate. That means both inputs have to be present to get an output or an OR gate. Uh, either input can cause an output and a leaf node is gray, which is an action that's taken. And if we take a look, now we'll get into a little bit of complexity, but it shows you the type of complexity that's involved in this type of analysis. If we can go to the next slide. Um, you see a tack tree that we're actually using for our signal bungalow. And the top node, we see tamper with vital PLC. That's Suppose somebody puts in a rogue program that throws the switch or um, will give a green on the signal lamp to an approaching train instead of a red. So let's say somebody uh, does a uh, program change and slips it in there. How could they do it? Well, this attack tree says it could be done by an insider, create a harmful file, install a harmful file, could be done by an outsider uh, physically breaking into the bungalow. So you go into all possibilities, and then we, by the likelihood, we prune these trees and come with some likely scenarios and then test our countermeasures that we're going to apply against that. So that's what we're doing now. It's very interesting. It's exciting. I think it's um, you know state of the art as far as a control security and having this for a recommended practice. Uh, next slide, we're saying, OK, it needs a special computer program. Who's going to do it? And certainly the transit agency would be involved, our control engineer. But they're not going to do that uh, attack tree. However, the systems integrator, we're talking about big companies, I'll just rattle four or five off, Siemens, GE Transportation, Alstom, Ansaldo, um, Talus, they would be equipped and would have the people who could learn the software, learn the attack tree procedure that we're going to be outlining in part three, work with their equipment vendors, and essentially take a look at the trouble spots or questionable spots as far as cybersecurity that the transit agency or they themselves want answers. So where are we on the learning curve? If we go to the next slide, we're moving right along. Um, Cyber 101 was part one. Part two and three are going to be the different security zones. And with attack modeling capability, we, have given, we will give to the industry the capability to analyze issues themselves. And then the uh, standards committee can kind of take a, a breather and go back and have the confidence that the industry can keep walking up the learning curve, eventually get to Cyber 404, whereupon they could pick up these documents and not need a translator, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we come to the summary. Uh, next slide, please. Our APTA working group has published part one. We'll be publishing part two in July. And these are public documents. They're free. They will be out on the APTA website, standards website that I've showed you before. Part two applies defense in depth and NIST 800 controls. It's got some teeth in it. And what we're hoping is that if regulation ever comes to rail transit, that the government or the regulating agency would be looking at the voluntary consensus recommended practices uh, if they want to make regulations and preferably use that. That's the best state of affairs. It would be kind of self-regulation in that it would use consensus standards coming from the industry. Part three, we're getting advanced. We're using attack modeling, add security controls for operational critical. 
So that's basically the summary of what I talked about. A next slide. We always ask for volunteers to join us for the working group. It's an open standards group, just like uh, ISA 99 or IEEE. And we have a lot of webinars. Our working group is going to meet in Philadelphia at the rail conference uh, sponsored by APTA. We're going to meet on June 5th and 6th. And APTA standards is offering a no charge course on recommended practice part two, the one that has teeth in it and will be coming out in July that the industry, the supply chain, has to respond to. Uh, there's a no charge course on that. It will be taught by myself from Tumen Technical and Lee Weber from Exeter. Um, 8.30 in the morning to 12.30 at the Philadelphia Convention Center. And Wednesday is when the rail conference is going on. So I invite you if you're interested to contact me, my contact information is on the next slide. And you can either give me a call, 610-398-5546, or email me, dave431 at enter.net. I will give you information. I can mail you a copy of the recommended practice part one. Part two will be out soon and we could sign you up, register you for the course. And if you'd like to join our working group or be an observer to the meeting, uh, we're in Philadelphia in June. So that concludes my talk. And Debbie, I guess I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you very much, Dave. That's a, it's, it's a great, com great conversation. We've got some, uh, I've got a couple thoughts of my own to, to throw on those couple of questions and I want to ask anybody else out there who has questions to, or uh, comments I'd like to put into either raise your hand or or type the question in um, but uh, uh, Dave it's interesting as you went through this and the uh, the uh, the least at the beginning you talk about the least uh, thing that can happen and uh, just coincidentally uh, I was in uh, Toronto at the time uh, it was 2000 Five two thousand and six when I started Lofty Perching, and that uh, that Go Train sign hack was sort of the first newsworthy item uh, that happened in that period. And oh, really? If, if that, and and we're in Toronto, we're right by the Go Train tracks and everything, and by the Go, Go Train mm -hmm. station, and uh, and it's that whole conversation. When we look at that as the least, you know, that was a CNN level event or CBC in Canadian terms, where the everyone was saying, "Well, they're hacking the trains; they can crash the trains." And it, it, there was a, a significant amount of effort put into just communicating to the media that no, that's not the train. It's actually a standalone plug-in little device where somebody had a you know had hacked a, 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 a the, the remote control basically that was not connected to the, the traction systems or the switching systems or anything. But from the public perception standpoint, the train system was hacked. So the reliability and safety safety of the train uh, system in in Canada. And, uh, and in Toronto was suspect. So even though that's the least attack, and it actually can't crash a train under any circumstance, it causes uh, probably cost a great deal of cash if you summed up, you know, the lost revenue, lost confidence, the amount of time people had to spend dealing with that. And uh, and uh, in in that same period, you know, it was landing lights um, that I had spent a lot of time looking at, and worth saying as well. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to crash an airliner by messing with landing lights. However, like this sign on the on the GO trains, if someone can hack into an airfield lighting system at Atlanta, Chicago, LAX, and that became a CNN level event, imagine the cost and complexity and impact, even though there was no real risk of actually causing an incident, uh, of the kind of incident we think about. You're not crashing a plane, you're not doing anything to it. But try to convince your your grandmother of that, and tell her that it's safe to get on a train or on a plane. So there's there was that I was thinking about as you went through this, and also the uh, your explanation of what what transit has done, what APT APTA has done, is a perfect example of the the value of cross sector communication. You know, as as you went through that, you're know, talking about the lessons you learned from NERC in the in the electric sector, for example. Um, I think that speaks to so much of 
how we how we address the risks. You know how we how we do the 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 meta job, the, the highest level overarching uh, reason we're, we're doing all this is by tying everything together. And that it's it's the knowledge sharing at the human level. I mean, you folks had read you know NERC and you were aware of that, and I know you had personally done a lot of work with power and were able to bring that into transportation. Um, but it, again, just speaks to so many of the issues that we concern ourselves with all the time, right? And uh, while I've got the soapbox for another minute, that just to answer a couple questions were pointed at uh, at uh, us and a couple others. Uh, I'll bring up real fast for yourself there. Uh, um, so the the question was: Are we building an implementation of knowledge sharing, or just a conceptual architecture? Um, our goal is to build an implementation a re a, that can be referenced. So with the ICS ISAC, we've got a number of, of entities and vendors and asset owners and others. Um, and state fusion centers and so forth uh, who, who uh, are willing to participate in this and build an architecture that actually works and is doing something and as an example of this can look at. Um, the, uh, the comment about uh, anonymization, absolutely. Even if you anonymize data under court order, one may be compelled to give up the attribution. Two points to that, um, to that question. One is, at the end of the day, national security and, and you know, quarters and so forth can trump anything. You know, you can say that, you know, you don't want to do anything, but if there's a threat to national security, you know, behind all the laws, and at the end of the day, none of us disagree with this. You know, if, if you know, the, the, the Soviets are, are coming, you know, the next five minutes and you have the keys, uh, that, you know, expect to, to hear from DOD, DHS, and so forth. The other half of that, though, is that in reality, you know, these are not the issues we deal with the vast majority of the time. And as you anonymize information correctly, you know, we at the ICS ISAC specifically don't want to hold a great deal of information. There's a lot of information we don't want to have. You know, you can't legally demand something from, uh, from someone if they don't have it. So a lot of the privacy protection that gets built into knowledge sharing networks involves not sharing knowledge that doesn't need to be shared in the first place. Now, certainly as the asset owner or as a vendor or a researcher or whatnot, if you actually hold information at some level of criticality, um, some legal or government entity or mechanism may break through your your corporate shield and your privacy shield. And, and again, that's a, that's a risk we all live with uh, all the time. Um, the uh, uh, question... For you, Dave, um, there was uh, which is why isn't SCADA safety critical? Doesn't SCADA control switching of tracks? Let's speak back to one of your slides. Um, I could take that, and it, it, it's all in the name. What we're calling SCADA, um, we have two different designations. It's like we're, we're splitting the term SCADA in half. If it's a SCADA system controlling the switching and the signaling, then it is safety critical. And that's the yellow zone, safety critical security zone. And those will be safety PLCs, just like an SIS would in, be in a chemical plant. So if it does those critical functions, then we consider it safety critical. Um, if the SCADA system is controlling electric power to the tracks, where the worst thing that can happen is somebody turns it off or something, produces a surge which damages equipment, then we call that operationally critical because it would not result in an immediate danger to people if somebody hacks into it. Yeah. I hope that answers it. Yes, I, at least for me. And the, the asker can can rephrase if they'd like uh, in there. And for the record, you know this this meeting typically goes. We, we schedule it for ninety minutes. We typically go you know, up an hour, ten, hour, and fifteen. And we'll take this. Uh, I'll have a couple of closing comments myself when all the questions and so forth are dealt with. So everybody, feel free to to keep them coming. In the meantime, um, one other. 
comment was that the APT working group should have a persistent connection to the ICI, ICS ISAC. Um, I plan to update this prezo a couple times a year. Uh, certainly, Dave, you know, I uh, agree with that. Dave is, uh, uh, has, we've discussed this sort of thing, um, and, uh, and not just with transportation, but with other sectors as well. And uh, the, so the ICS ISAC is right around the, the one-year anniversary date from its initial conception. It's, in, for all practical purposes, really been sort of functional for the last two quarters. So we're still very much in the process of, of building out capabilities, uh, bringing in subject matter experts uh, from specific sectors. Like, you know, I don't think you can do much better than, than Dave for the, the rail and transportation side of things um, is an obvious first step. Uh, continuing that process so that those connections uh, um, stay, stay rich and developed. Creating communities inside the center amongst our overall community. Uh, uh, transportation community, electric power community, water, manufacturing, chemical, maritime, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are all things that have been that have been built into the planning of the center and will develop and execute those capabilities in those communities and those activities um, as it reflects the the uh, the interest and the and the, the the value you know at, at points in time. So very much uh, uh, very good to, to have those issues brought up and let you folks know that we're, we're, we are very much thinking about exactly those, those sorts of things. Uh, another question, Dave and Chris, are the implications for business loss taken into account in your recommendations? Have private enterprises worked with you, not necessarily just companies directly tied to the rail industry? So Dave, you want to talk about that for a minute, the business loss? Okay, it sounds like a two-part question. Or, so, so the first are implications for business loss taken into account? Yes. Um, indirectly, but not directly. What we did was, uh, I would say, when we categorized the systems uh, for transit agencies, you know, loss of life, uh, people getting hurt, um, is you know the worst thing that can happen. And, of course, associated with that, you know, if the trains crash, there's a business loss. Um, generally, we took it into account indirectly, not directly. For instance, if somebody got into what we're calling the operational critical security zone, the green, and let's say they sent a power pulse down to all the substations or, or just something like that, that could be a substantial loss, but it, it's in the green, so that would be a business loss. So our framework was mainly based on, uh, you know, people safety, and, and but it does have, of course, business loss if that would happen, and then just business loss alone. And for instance, if somebody hits the enterprise system, which we're not even covering in our particular working group. That would, of course, be a business loss, also. Yeah, and I'll, I'll so that the first uh, part of the question I think I answered. Yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll essentially take the second half of that. You know, uh, um, generally speaking, the answer is is yes. You know, I, I'm not uh, uh, personally as up to speed on this in in rail as Dave, but uh, uh, with, uh, for example, on, on April 29th, we're doing another public briefing. Um, uh, with the American Water Works Association on on a uh, um, uh, one of our members, we're, we're beginning to do a uh, um, what's been done in some of the other ISACs, you know, working with members to bring their products or services at a discount when they're when they're appropriately vetted by an existing member as, as being something you know, useful. And uh, Management Analytics has an assessment process that does that focuses on the who you are side of things. You know, helping uh, asset owners determine you know what they are from the highest highest level you know help them prioritize and that right there is a big part of it so when you look at a water facility and um, who they are among the things you look at is you know what is your loss in case of so you know among the impacts of messing with a, uh, a drinking water you know, a, a, a water supply utility for example um, is the loss of revenue and 
you know, wastewater, for example, you know, you can contaminate the environment, or with drinking water, you can contaminate the water, you know, make it poisonous with, with fluoride, um, and, and suffer, suffer financial risk as well. So I think the answer is, is, is absolutely yes. And it's very clear that as, as the industry of security people and organizations, uh, we have a, uh, a responsibility to make sure that we're successful. A huge part of that is uh, making sure that we point out to business executives and people who are, are uh, responsible for the, the financial health of facilities and, and utilities and so forth that we point out um, not just you know the, the Boy Scout reasons for doing this work, but the business impact, the financial reasons for doing this work as well. Um, another comment in the questions, um, I think this was worth bringing up. It's uh, publishing these documents on the net might help potential hackers to circumvent the defenses. Uh, this is a very interesting point, and it speaks, I think, to the, the knowledge sharing processes. Um, there are two general uh, schools of thought on this issue, and they go back to the dawn of security of all sorts, not just electronic security. One is that as long as we don't tell anybody you know, security through obscurity, then no one will know how to break things. The other school of thought says that the more peer review we have, the more different experts look at something, um, the, the better the security is. You know, combining in with that, we have the value, the time value of knowledge where if uh, the APTA, for example, comes up with methodologies and schemes and so forth for, for increasing security, um, are we all better off for them to communicate that as broadly as possible? And uh, if they're communicating that, if they're trying to control that, so it only gets to, they're, they're using a lot of effort, they're trying to contain that information, that knowledge, only to the appropriate entities, uh, how realistic is that? You know, if there are you know, Dave, I, I think you said some numbers of the size of your industry, of, of the uh, tr transport industry, but there's there's hundreds and thousands of organizations with hundreds and thousands, ten thousands, of hundreds of thousands of individuals. You know, is it even realistic to try to contain knowledge? Um, and uh, well, well, I have a, I have just a um, kind of observation or a practice that we've adopted to address that. If if you'd like to hear that. Oh, please. OK, so what we've done, we realize um, you know, you, you, we don't want to give away the cotton store as far as security. Uh, just the same, uh, when I showed the picture of what's inside a signaling bungalow, I mean, if we go to advertisements, you know, that'll be, or a trade show, that'll be the glossy that's shown. We, we haven't gotten down to equipment numbers, part numbers, uh, network diagrams, et cetera. And when we do attack modeling, now we have to be very careful because the first half is we go top down 40,000 foot. So we go down to the diagram, but then if it's going to be a combination of the transit agency engineer and the systems integrator and the vendors, at the point where you've got a network diagram and you've picked out the PLC to be XYZ model such and such, then we're recommending that that be company confidential. And certainly, we wouldn't put it in a recommended practice. And we, we do have to work an example but we're not giving away the company store when we do that. It's just common knowledge in the field that somebody could pick up on bulletin boards or, or whatever. So um, any possibility of giving uh, valuable inside information, we're taking account. And we're just not going there when we publish our documents to the public. Yeah. And uh, yeah. The, at the end of the day, this is, a, this is an issue that's very well known. You know, we look at uh, two frames we can look at this, between the public sector and the private sector, and the way knowledge is shared, and also between experts, you know, subject matter experts in security and uh, in, in others. And there's uh, the, the uh, NIAC report 
from last January uh, is, is, I think, very interesting. It's looking at information sharing. And it's saying that inside the government, the federal government particularly, there's a Cold War need-to-know mentality. It's very hard to share information. Among the private sector, there's a very, uh, very rich information sharing among peers. You know, that, that we create personally, we create, create uh, trust boundaries and we share information very richly. Um, we we will constantly have to have to to check this balance, and it's something that all of us, not just as the ISAC uh, specifically, but all of us, you know, in all the roles that that, that we fill, uh, have to have to think about it a lot. You know, there's uh, value to sharing information. Our adversaries share it freely, you know, pr uh, prolif uh, uh, prolifically, and. Uh, uh, we have a, a very, very large constituency. There's hundreds of thousands, millions of facilities, millions, certainly, and tens of millions of individuals, good guys, like good folks that need to have this knowledge. How do we get that to them? What value do we have holding it uh, extremely tight? And uh, I think it's very clear that this would be one of these issues that we work through a great deal. It's part of this reference architecture. Uh, uh, the, the need for this reference architecture is, is just that. It's not the technology. Technology is frankly easy and, and pretty well, I think, completely done at this point. It's how we decide what information gets shared by, for example, um, a private company in the transportation industry with um, a local government, state government, federal government. How, what kind of information and how much gets shared with, with their competitors and for what reasons and for what legal risks and how we manage all that. So, so Dave, unless you have any final thoughts or comments you want to throw out there. I just want to use my closing slide or two and let Debbie uh, uh, sing us out. Uh, no, I, I think I pretty much said what I wanted to say. And well said as well. So, the, uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up today and for everybody who's watching this online for taking the time to do so. The uh, ICS ISAC is a membership driven organization consists primarily of its members. Uh, we get benefit from having you, you involved at whatever level uh, you choose to. Uh, we are funded by our members, so obviously our ability to exist is is linked to uh, organizations becoming members. We have information because it comes from you, and we get our information uh, not just to you, but through you. Service providers and vendors and other organizations uh, that hear knowledge, get knowledge from us, to our last point, um, can share it with, with others and, uh, and, and raise all boats and uh, make the world a slightly better place to be, which is important because for the rest of our natural lives and unnatural if we're lucky, uh, we will live in, a, in an independent uh, world where the, not just the ongoing existence of our one infrastructure is itself dependent on the existence of the individual infrastructures like rail and transportation and power and water and and wind and everything else, uh, but where all of us are dependent on on each other uh, for the for the ongoing and and continuously improving uh, uh, societal web we live in. So we do these calls uh, once a month. Uh, these public briefings we do members only briefings uh, quite regularly on a weekly basis and and more often. We'll be doing more of these public briefings uh, just because the the issues and speakers are stacking up. Uh, which is great. Next week, uh, next month, we'll be doing a session on uh, uh, the evolution of information sharing and how this is all going, uh, which is particularly timely with uh, with the executive order and everything else moving forward. And if you want to get a hold of us, you can find us at info at icsisac.org and uh, several thousand other places. So, Debbie, if you want to uh, uh, read us out, I want to just thank everybody for showing up. All right, very good. I've had to switch over to the phone, so hopefully you guys can hear me now a little better and it'll be a little clearer. So on behalf of all of us at the ICS ISAC, we appreciate your joining us today. We hope that you found the information of value and something that you can take and implement to further secure your industrial control system. As a reminder, a recording of today's webinar will be available on the ICS ISAC website. Our next briefing will be a special panel discussion on Monday, April 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time titled, Raising All Boats, Establishing Security Baselines at Industrial Facilities. On May 15th, we have a regular third Wednesday's public briefing 
when we will host a panel on evolving of oh, excuse me on the evolution of knowledge sharing. In June, we have Waterfalls Andrew Ginter discussing unidirectional gateways. Other sessions will be announced in our monthly updates on our center's website and in our other communication vehicles. Thank you again for your participation on today's call, and we hope you have an awesome rest of your day.